Georgia Peaches, uh, I think for me, is an interesting story because it's, it's personal. My dad was the bombardier on, the, it was a B-24 bomber. Um, he never talked much about what had gone on during the war, but uh, later on I learned a lot more about it and really it was a fascinating case. It actually ended up being pro uh, prosecuted at the Dachau trials in 1946 and 47. My father's crew assembled sometime in 1943. He had left his senior year at the University of Maine early, had enlisted, um, had gone to bombardier school in Big Spring, Texas. The pilot of the plane was, was Herbert Frells from Texas. They assembled the crew and the, and the plane they took over was called the Flak Man. The Flak Man was a brand new plane. They flew it the southern route from West Palm Beach to Brazil, to the west coast of Africa, to the north coast of Africa, and then on to Vernosa, where the 15th Air Force was flying out of in Italy. When they got there, that plane was taken away from them, and they got the Georgia Peach. It was uh, G-A-W-G-I-A, -A, as if it was said with an accent. That plane had engine trouble. Um, there were 10 guys, the usual makeup of, of the crew in those days. They flew four missions out of Vernosa, including one on the Fawesti oil fields. On the fifth mission, which was on June 13th, 1944, they load up the plane at 6.30 in the morning. They had engine trouble. They were in the high box in the rear. They fell behind. A flock of uh, Measure Schmitz got them and shot the plane up pretty good. Nine guys bailed out. The pilot, Herbert Frells, thought that, that there were men trapped in the rear. There were some flames. He th it had been shot up pretty well. So he actually rode the plane down and crash landed it in this farmer's field uh, in a place called Ange, which is near uh, the little market town of uh, Ottenkirchen. My dad ended up in a farmer's field. Everybody was captured pretty prominent, pr pretty quickly, except for one man, Ivy, who evaded capture for four days. In 44, the Nazis were starting to call um, American flyers air terrorists. And, the pop and they were trying to stir up the population to turn on them, and that was starting to happen. In my father's case, three of the men were murdered on the ground. One man, uh, the navigator Vincent from Boston, apparently his chute either did not deploy properly or he might have been wounded in the plane and they shoved him out, hoping he, hoping he would make it. He's buried in France in one of the military cemeteries. The other three, um, uh, another officer, Griggs and two enlisted men, Boynton and Ivy, were, uh, two were shot and one was bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Uh, Ivy was found on the 17th of June wandering along a road. He was thrown into the car and then eventually um, told to get out and run towards a wood line and they shot him in the back a number of times. Um, the thing that makes that so interesting was there aren't that many recorded cases, as far as I know, in World War II of those kinds of atrocities. And after the war, the American authorities found 10 people that were implicated. Uh, three were acquitted at the Dachau trials in 46. Um, five of them went to, had prison sentences and two were hung at Landau Prison. So it's really kind of a, my father's story seems like, at least for me, he was a great hero. He was my dad. Um, and it, it is a little unusual in that there were these, these men were killed. I've talked to other survivors, the families, and they never knew what happened to these people. What happens to my dad from that point is, and it was pretty typical, I guess, there were something like 40,000 flyers that went down during the war. And my father was, was, was patched up in the hospital he was taken to an interrogation center uh, near, uh, I think, Frankfurt. And um, later he was sent off by rail to Stalag III in Zagen, Poland. It was the sort of the home of the Great Escape. He was there for some time. Um, he, he said basically the truth was that in, in terms of all the POW camps in Germany, that was a pretty good one to be in. He said they were treated pretty well. It was run by the Luftwaffe and they sort of viewed the American and, and, and British and Canadian pilots and, and crew members as sort of kindred spirits. So he said, actually, you know, you didn't want to try to escape because that was harsh, but they were given enough food to survive. 
Uh, they were given water. There were actually a lot of entertainments. They they had uh, you know they had a, a theater and a newspaper and uh, you know they ran their own military operation. At the end of January of '45, the Russians were coming in from the east, and they had known about this for some time. They were preparing for it. They were. It was a very very cold winter. The winter of '45, '44, '45. They uh, they were finding ways to insulate their clothes with paper. They were making makeshift sleds out of wood. They were hoarding food. They knew this was coming. Uh, I think it was around 10.30 at night, they told, they started just sending everybody out by compound. There were four major compounds. My father said they basically marched about 50 miles in the snow. Most of the guards were older men. They were sent, because they could no longer be pilots, they were sent to, to guard um, the, um, the prisoners and he said they're struggling through the snow much like we were and he said the young GIs ended up carrying their rifles in a lot of cases to help them out. He said there was no place to escape to. We figured if we stayed with the group we would eventually find food and water. They eventually did. They uh, came, they marched back into Germany through the snow. They were put on these basically cattle cars packed in, my father said that, you know, men would die and freeze to death next to you and, and there was just no room to do anything with anybody. They were on those for two and a half days and finally ended up in Mooseburg, Germany, where there was a huge POW camp. As a matter of fact, the, curiously, the, the place where my father's plane landed near Ottenkirchen is probably only about five or ten minutes by car to Mooseburg. So he, he did this huge circle went out to Poland and came back again. They were in that place for quite some time until the end of, uh, the end of April when Patton's 14th Armored Division came through and, and liberated on April 29th, they liberated both uh, Mooseburg, which apparently had up to 100,000 prisoners in it from all, all allied countries, men, women, slave laborers. They also liberated Dachau on the same day. He was put on a a former German cruise ship that had been taken by the Allies and renamed the, the USS Lejeune. And they left Le Havre uh, just before the end of May and got into New York Harbor on the 2nd or 3rd of June. The memorial um, to me, it was really surprising. I'd never heard of anything like this being done. Adolf Weidmann, who was the former mayor, he sort of conceived of a, putting up a memorial to these four men who died. Um, he raised the money, he was involved with the design, and so he was really the prime mover behind this. Uh, it's a beautiful memorial, it's probably about six feet tall, there were benches, trees, and I was sort of, sort of surprised the Germans had done this. It seemed odd to me that they, sort of our former enemy, would do this, but what became clear to all of us as we talked to these people uh, was that the Germans had some guilt about what had happened. And they were also glad to be free of the Nazi regime. And so for them, I think it was a way to honor not only the people in my father's crew, but also to, in a way, kind of put it behind them. Uh, and they felt great about it, we felt great that they did it. Uh, this is a, an artifact that came back uh, from World War II. I've uh, had it for a, quite a number of years. It's, it's a pretty typical Nazi helmet from the war. The thing that makes it very special for me and very personal is that my dad obviously found this and decided to keep it. I'm glad he did. And what makes it very personal is he put his name inside. Uh, Chester D. Cram Jr. He has his uh, serial number. Uh, he had uh, U.S. Army Air Force, and then kind of the, the in information about where he, where he got this. So it says, if I can read, it says Mooseburg, Germany, April 29, 1945. Um, it said POWs, POWs liberated by 14th Armored Division of the 3rd Army. So to me, this has always been a kind of a cherished relic of his experiences. I was always very proud of my dad. Um, he ended up um, obviously getting an air medal. He was wounded in combat, so he had a Purple Heart, and he also received a dis Distinguished Flying Cross.
I grew up understanding that World War II was the most momentous thing that had happened to my dad's generation, but I think also to mine too. It, it flavored all of those years right up until the Vietnam War came along. I think it's important to, to commemorate this and to pa I try to pass it along to my kids. And they're in, they're in their late 30s and they're starting to become interested in it. Um, you know, we hear the, we hear the, the phrase, it was the, the greatest generation. Those are easy words to say. I think it's really difficult to understand what all these men did, and women too, uh, what they went through. The, the thing that always amazes me when I look at the numbers, the, the scope of the war was so vast. Tens of millions of people died. Um, the amount of, of the, the number of planes and tanks and, and trucks that were used, for example, by the U.S. and the Soviet Union and the Germans and, and all of uh, the, the other allies is astonishing. My father was in the 15th Air Force. That was pretty much newly um, constituted in, in 43. They lost 3,300 aircraft just out of that 15th Air Force that flew out of um, the, the boot of Italy. The numbers are astonishing. I don't think today we can understand what that was like. If, if we're involved in a conflict and we lose a plane, it's news. They would go out and lose on some flights, for Westy, for example, they would lose large numbers of the aircraft. And, and the men accepted this. I mean, I think they must have known when they went out that their number might be up. If you volunteered for the Army Air Corps and you were in bombers in Europe, um, just the statistics were such that you were either going to be killed, uh, either in enemy fire or in an accident, or you're going to be taken prisoner. Very few people got through unscathed. So, you know, these are the guys that, that gave us the world we have today. If they hadn't stopped the Germans, I don't know what the world would have been like. So I think it's really incredibly important to pass along this legacy so that the, 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 the younger generations today understand everything that was given. And these guys, every man I've ever talked to from World War II simply says, we're just doing our job. And by today's standards, that seems incredible to me. And it's something worth preserving.